amazing tensile strength, but then the two parts fall apart with ease. Today we explore the world of 3D printable Velcro. I'm proud to be part of a community that creates amazing things by building upon the work of each other, and that's exactly what I hope to do today. This video is all about fully 3D printable Velcro, and I've created a parametric version that you can easily customize to suit your own needs. This video started when browsing printables, and I noticed they had recently had a Velcro themed competition. And for most of the designs, you were meant to add off the shelf Velcro to the printed portion, However, some of the entries relied completely on 3D printing to form their part. Naturally, I wondered how well this actually worked and could it compare to real Velcro. I'm sure pretty much everyone has heard of Velcro. This is actually a brand name and the generic name is Hook and Loop System. And as that name implies, Velcro has two halves. On the left in black, we see the hooks. These are stiff and plasticky. And on the right hand side, we see the loops. These are soft like wool. When we bring the two halves together, the hooks interface with the loops and become tangled. And in case you can't visualize that, here's what's happening on a micro scale. The amount of strength achieved with this interface is surprisingly good, and it's not until we peel it apart from one end at a time that it's easy to separate the two. In fact, when the grip of the Velcro fails, it's for this reason. A patch of hooks and loops are very strong in unison, and they only start to fail when an angle is created between the two surfaces, and therefore only a narrow band of hooks and loops are coming undone at a single time. If the two surfaces can stay parallel, the strength is quite impressive. So how does 3D printed Velcro work? To answer this, we're going to study two examples. The first, by MM Printing, was the winner of the competition, with that design being a remix of printable Velcro by Ariad. The second design we're going to look at is Plastic Velcro by Bowie Inc. And to me, this one stood out because the individual components were so large and easy to see. Both of these models have STLs ready to print along with some instructions. On the left, we have the version by MM Printing with the much finer pattern. This is quite satisfying to push together and you can feel each of the little components sliding past each other. And to help illustrate what I'm talking about, here's a simple 3D model. We'll notice that each of the little towers is actually tapered to be wider at the top. And if we look at the negative between each of these towers, we have the exact pattern, but in reverse. And returning to the hand, our knuckles are actually slightly wider than the base of our fingers, which means if we mesh the two together, the knuckles will overlap. And if they're meshed tightly, we'll have some sort of strength in this junction. So if we put two of these into an assembly and then move them into position so they interlock, we can see that like my knuckles, we have wider parts sliding past narrower parts. And that's what holds the two halves together. For me, the most interesting part was when I enabled hidden edges, as this illustrates where the individual towers overlap and where there's gaps. And I was surprised to find that there was a hexagon pattern formed when the two halves went together. And looking at the printed version together under a light, we can see that this hexagon pattern is verified. The version from Bowie Inc works in a similar way, but this time because the components are so much bigger, they make quite a loud click as you snap them into place. The individual towers here are much more complicated in their shape, but the principle is the same. We have room for a wider section to slide past and then be trapped underneath. Like real Velcro, the easiest way to separate these is to create an angle and then separate them from one side through to the other. And that means these two designs have the same basic operation so far, but there are some differences. For instance, the finer version will only work when the two halves are aligned. And by that I mean that even when I flip it, both pieces are still horizontally aligned. If I rotate one of the pieces 90 degrees, the two will just not interlock together as the patterns don't line up. The Bowie Ink version is the opposite of this. I can align both halves horizontally and the two will snap together, or I can rotate one half 90 degrees and the two halves will go together without any difference. So more forgiving, but not as forgiving as actual Velcro, where the loop side is randomized to the point where nothing needs to be aligned at all, you just press the two halves together. So it does work, but then the next question I had was what was the best filament to print the Velcro with? To answer this, I printed three versions of each. The top from PLA, the middle PETG, and the bottom TPU. For me, this represented a spectrum of rigidity, with PLA being the most rigid, TPU being the most flexible, and PETG being somewhere in between, but closer to PLA. 
The first thing to note is that typically PLA is the cleanest printing of these three filaments, but that's not necessarily a good thing when it comes to 3D printed Velcro, as the PLA version had a much looser fit compared to the other materials. The two halves stuck together, but grip felt limited. Compare this to the PETG, and we have some fine stringing present between all of the little towers. But rather than jam the join, this just made a satisfying feeling as I had to squeeze the two halves together. The added resistance also felt like extra bonding strength. The TPU version also had some fine stringing, but because this material is so flexible, it was hard to get the two halves to lock together that strongly. They feel great as you push them together, but as soon as you apply some sort of tensile load trying to pull them apart, the two halves flex and introduce an angle, which makes it easy to separate the two. For the Bowie ink version, the material wasn't anywhere near as important, with PLA having a satisfying click, and despite this feeling accurate, there was visible play between the two halves. The PT version felt more or less the same, with the satisfying click and then the same play in between the two halves. As you might expect, the soft TPU version felt more rubbery and didn't have the click when putting it together, but like the first design, as you applied a load, the two halves would bend and then pull apart like a zipper. On balance, PTG seems to be the best filament and a little bit of stringing can actually be beneficial. Next question, actually how strong is this stuff? I like both designs, but from this point onwards, I'm going to stick with the version from MM Printing as it feels the most like actual Velcro. To test the tensile strength, I created this larger version and then snipped off a tab from each end so the two halves could be joined together with a flap from each sticking out on either end. One side was clamped to my workbench using some MDF blocks and then the flap for the second side had some holes drilled in it with some string threaded through, giving me a loop that I could hang various weights on. Let's start light and work our way up with the first weight here being half a kilogram. And as I had hoped, this represented no trouble at all. I doubled the weight to one kilogram and once again, zero issues. Let's escalate things and jump up to two and a half kilograms. It feels like it should be a harder test, but once again, the printed Velcro can hold it comfortably. So let's double the load once more to five kilograms and once more, zero issues. This really is quite impressive, but the best was yet to come because when I doubled the weight to 10 kilograms, once again, this 3D printed Velcro was easily up to the job. There's no tricks here, we just have string going through a thin 3D printed flap, with the other flap being clamped to the table, and the only thing holding the two halves together, the interaction between thousands of tiny little 3D printed towers. Let's try our luck and double the mass again to 20 kilograms, and unfortunately, that's where things failed. But it wasn't the Velcro that failed, in fact, the two halves are still stuck together. 20 kilos had overcome the clamping force on the flap for the top half. Inspecting the test piece, we can see that only one corner had started to come undone, and that looks to be from the string contorting and flexing that edge. The Velcro is so intact that I'm simply not strong enough to pull the two halves apart. Yet when we peel from one corner, the two halves come apart so, so easily. If the clamping hadn't failed, we can see that the string had almost ripped its way out of the thin ends, confirming that the Velcro bond was nowhere near being the weakest link. All of this from a contact patch, approximately 130 by 65 millimeters. And that's because each of these little towers can catch on each other, but they're weak. But this is a great example of strength in numbers. As we multiply them, that tiny bit of strength also multiplies and the end result is quite a strong junction to the point where we're not strong enough to pull it apart by hand. I'm going to assume that you're also impressed and now you wanna use it in your own designs. And now I'm gonna show you just how easy that is. You could import the STL into something like Mesh Mixer and use the measurement tool to reverse engineer the dimensions and then model it yourself in CAD, but that's not for everyone. So what I've done is made a fully parametric version that anyone can edit with these presets in free software called OpenSCAD. In case you didn't know, OpenSCAD is 3D modeling where the geometry is generated by scripting. It's available for everything and I've linked the download page in the description. Once you open the software and then my file, this is what you'll be presented with and you can ignore all of the code on the left hand side unless you're planning to remix again. Everything you need is on the right hand side and there's four sections to expand and we'll quickly go through them one by one. The first of these deals with the Velcro tower elements, each of these little nodules sitting on the surface. The default setting is one millimeter, but you can make it bigger or smaller. And in doing so, like the rest of these parameters, everything will regenerate in a few seconds. I wouldn't really recommend playing with this that much. Here's a version where everything is scaled up to a size of two millimeters. And the two halves go together without any issues, but they don't lock particularly tight. 
The two halves stick together when on an angle, but they can't even hold their own weight when pulled by gravity. And that brings us nicely onto our second parameter, interference, which controls how tight the fit is. If you found the fit of your print a little bit loose, you can put this variable down, and it will move the towers closer together for more overlap. And if you're finding things a bit tight, you can slide it upwards, which will increase the spacing between the towers. I'd start with both of the default settings, do a test print and make fine adjustments as required. The next section is the pattern, which will dictate how big the grid of little towers are. If we put both of these down to one, we can see that two towers make up a single unit. And if we set them to five and 10, we can see that we have a square pattern. And that's because horizontally, the two towers are twice as wide as they are tall. So keep this in mind as you're deciding how many items to pattern each way. The next section relates to the base plate. First, we have a thickness, the default being 0.5 millimeters, which gives a good amount of flex. You can make this as thick or as thin as you like using the slider. After that, we have a border for both horizontal and vertical, and we can control the two independently. Our final parameter is resolution, and if we zoom in, we can see what it does. Here, each circle is made up of 12 segments. We can put this all the way down to five, and this will speed up the processing, the preview, and the export at the expense of accuracy, and we can turn it way up if we want to go the other way. A higher value giving us much rounder circles, but please keep in mind as you grow the pattern, the processing time becomes quite excessive. From my testing, I found 12 to be quite a good middle ground, but play as you wish. What we're seeing here is only the preview, and before we can export as an STL, we need to come up to design and then come to render. I've tried to optimize this as best as I can, but it's always going to be slower than the preview we were seeing in the screen earlier. For instance, this version taking just over 22 seconds, and obviously this will depend on your computer. If we're happy with what we see, we come up to file and then come down to export and we can select STL or another format of our choice. An Achilles heel of OpenSCAD is the rendering time. And as you scale things up, as we see with this version here, things grind to a halt, with the rendering phase taking an hour and 15 minutes. And this was still with the resolution on a lowly 12, so be prepared to wait even longer if you want to turn up the detail. This model also took quite a long time to slice and I thought it had crashed several times. I didn't time it exactly, but this took somewhere between 20 minutes to half an hour to slice in Orca Slicer. So now we have a way to easily generate different sizes and configurations of printable Velcro, but how can we actually use it? I haven't done this myself, but there's an article linked below that explains that FreeCAD can import SCAD files and give you 3D geometry that you can then edit natively. Otherwise, you can export SDLs and then import them into something like Tinkercad, adding on other design shapes, such as this boss on the end for bolting the Velcro to other objects. You can also do this directly in your slicer, bringing in additional shapes and assuming they overlap, when you slice them, they'll be counted as one object. Alternatively, you can print out sheets of Velcro as big as your printer bed allows. And because most of the time the base is so thin, it's quite easy to segment up the larger shape into smaller ones using scissors or a blade. If you'd then like to get an empty border back, each tiny tower is actually quite weak in isolation, so they're easy to scrape off and leave behind whatever shape you need. And although they won't be as perfect as if you would model them from scratch, you can easily create some quite interesting shapes using this technique. These shapes are generic, but of course you could form those that simply aren't possible to buy, with the benefit of being able to choose exactly what color you want, and also being able to reposition the objects on the baseboard as many times as you like. I can't recommend enough that you print out some test pieces just to experience the tactile sensation. And if you intend to take this further with Velcro integrated into your own designs, let me know what your plan is in the comments section. Thanks to Ariad and MM Printing for providing the base designs that I remixed. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, happy 3D printing Velcro. G'day, it's Michael again. If you like the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.